Welcome to the Gestalt IT Rundown, where each time we meet, we run down the IT news of the week, sometimes with insight, but always with snark. I'm your host, Stephen Foskett, publisher of Gestalt IT. Joining me today is a special guest co-host, Chris Grundeman. Welcome to the show, Chris. Thanks, Stephen. It's uh, great to be here. Yeah, in addition to doing some uh, consulting and content creation, I'm a co-host of the Utilizing AI podcast here on Gestalt IT as well, uh, and excited to uh, talk about some news today. Well, it's really great to have you here, Chris. Um, for those of you who don't know, Tom Hollingsworth, our normal host, is currently running the Security Field Day event for Gestalt IT today. So if you're interested in enterprise security, uh, just head over to techfieldday.com all day long today and tomorrow to see that uh, event go on live. So Chris, uh, let's dive into the stories of today. Uh, VMware is acquiring Mesh 7, which provide a cloud-native API security mesh. This seems to be a move to eventually bolster the security VMware can offer with Tanzu Service Mesh. That's interesting as it could create a fully integrated API and service mesh product. Uh, but what's driving this demand? Yeah, Stephen, this is pretty interesting. Um, and, and even just what Mesh 7 does is kind of interesting, right? So the way they say it is an enterprise class native distributed API firewall and gateway solution, right? Which, which we're obviously jamming a lot of things together there. Um, and then, you know, when we eventually see VMware tie that into uh, their Tanzu product, we'll see kind of a real uh, amalgamation of things here. And I think the real driving force behind this is one, the continued drive away from kind of monolithic location based uh, applications to more microservices based distributed applications, right, which is obviously the drive behind service mesh. But now we're seeing folks want to combine their service mesh with their APIs. And then of course, add security to it. And I think Mesh 7 is really the security side of that. And so if I had to say, you know, what's driving this in one word, DevSecOps. Um, maybe that's not actually one word, but that's really where uh, all of this is coming from. And I think providing that kind of unified experience where you can uh, build applications along with the, the connectivity that they need and the security they need all in one package is really what VMware is aiming at here. So Stephen, we've talked about Deterra in previous episodes, most recently back on February 17th, when CEO Guy Churchwood resigned. But more news just came in and it isn't great. Deterra is being liquidated and the doors are being shut. Uh, although it's always sad to see a company shut down, is there more to this story? Yeah, as we discussed back then, uh, it wasn't really good news, but they were trying to put a positive spin on it at the time um, that uh, you know this was a planned uh, resignation for the CEO and that they were gonna be putting somebody else in charge, but they didn't, weren't quite sure who. Well, turns out nobody. Um, everything that we've heard, uh, you know, we've heard some uh, rumors from some of our friends over there uh, that are connected with the company says that uh, effectively the company shut down immediately and has been shutting down for a little while. Um, it's pretty sad to see this sort of thing happen, uh, but frankly, Deterra never found their niche. Um, you know, they had an interesting product. They had some interesting technology. Uh, they just never found out or figured out where to use it, how to sell it, how to pitch it. Um, and that's sad. Uh, I think that what's going to happen probably is we will see somebody end up buying the liquidated company for its uh, patents and software portfolio, because uh, that often does happen, and there's usually some value there. But um, yeah, I'd say that uh, this marks the end of a uh, Silicon Valley startup and a tech field day presenter, and um, you know we hate to see him go. But you know, I do wish the best for the uh, the founders, uh, the team, and of course, for everyone who works there uh, as well. In other news, Chris, uh, Microsoft just announced that they're going to commit to bringing in availability zones to every company they operate in by the end of the year. Uh, all of those data center regions that are launched in the future will include availability zones as well. Uh, this sounds impressive, especially given what we've seen recently with uh, data center outages and data sovereignty questions. Uh, but is this big news? Yeah, I think it is. Um, and it's, it comes on the heels of, I think Microsoft launched 14 new countries where they did data center regions um, last year. And so this year they're upping all of those with availability zones. And then as you said, committing to all new data center regions having availability zones. And I think you're exactly right. 
with kind of comparing this to some of the, re, you know, the recent big fire we saw at OVH and, and a lot of folks getting upset that their uh, applications or, or storage wasn't a redundant. Obviously, there's a little bit of buyer beware there, as, as you and Tom talked about last week. Uh, but Microsoft making, you know, strong moves to help eliminate that risk in the future by providing availability zones, which obviously, um, you know, create resiliency and availability, uh, enhance scalability, and, um, and in some cases, you know, compliance or regulatory needs. So I, I think this is big news. And I think um, hopefully we'll see other folks do the same thing and start to provide uh, additional redundancy, not, not just, you know, in North America and Europe, but across the world where they operate. Uh, an, another news story today is uh, the fact that mega distributors, Cinex and Tech Data are merging. Um, this might sound like a little bit of inside baseball, but resellers are a major source of technology and expertise in today's enterprise. And these are two of the biggest. Uh, there's also a private equity angle here with the deal put together by an investment firm called Apollo. What's their angle? Thanks, Chris. Yeah, this is uh, probably not news for a lot of people and probably huge news for their customers, which make up a lot of our listening audience. So if you were using Cinex or Tech Data, um, or if you were using a reseller who worked with these distributors, um, you know, this might affect you a little bit. Uh, effectively, we've got a new big gorilla in town, a $57 billion gorilla with 22,000 employees. This is huge. Uh, effectively, the um, IT server computers and servers and storage and networking and all that kind of stuff, how this stuff gets to the hands of customers is not a straightforward path. Most companies don't actually buy from the companies that we associate the company with their name on the tin. Instead, they buy from a reseller, which buys from a distributor, which signs with the company to provide these products. And in many cases, those purchases include not just um, you know, hardware, but software and services, integration services, all that sort of thing. Well, Cinex and um, Tech Data are two of the biggest uh, distributors of uh, IT equipment from the data center to, uh, you know, even things like, you know, telephones and so on. And, so on. and uh, they have been for a really long time. Um, as a funny aside, uh, one of my uh, favorite weird things that I found out about this story, uh, Cinex actually used to be called Compaq back in 1980 when it was founded. I know you're like, wait, Compaq? Yeah, Compaq with a C. Uh, they were uh, changed their name to Cinex in 1994 because there was another company called Compaq that was getting a lot of attention in the 80s and the 90s. Um, anyway, they uh, had grown into you know really a gorilla in terms of distributing tech for uh, most of the major IT companies, and uh, the same is true of Tech Data. Um, as you mentioned, there's also a private equity angle here. Apollo is a uh, you know big private equity firm that is uh, you know spans the globe. Uh, they're actually they've got about a half a billion dollars of uh, money under management, and they had invested here and are basically bringing these two together. This is a typical private equity play where you know you invest in a company, you figure out a way to kind of uh, turn it around and um, and then you, uh, you know, merge it or sell it. Uh, but the interesting angle here is that when this deal is done, Apollo is going to be left with a major share of the combined entity. In fact, uh, from my uh, word, I'm trying to actually see the numbers here. Um, Apollo will end up with uh, 44 million shares in the combined uh, company at the end which uh, represents about 45% of the company. So this is not the kind of private equity deal where they walk away and wash their hands uh, with the cash. Instead, this is the kind of deal where they're gonna walk away and still own a good bit of the, uh, the combined entity. What that means to me is that we might see another big transaction here soon where they sort of cash out of an even bigger gorilla in the uh, IT distributor or reseller marketplace. So basically watch this space. I think that we're gonna see more transactions coming down the pike. 
Chris, uh, we've been uh, noticing a, a new data center company uh, appearing on the radar called Server Domes. Um, they announced uh, Ken Patchett as their CEO, uh, and he's a hyperscale veteran with a ton of data center experience from Microsoft, Google, and Facebook. But this isn't what's interesting about the story. What's interesting is these freaky UFO looking uh, colo facilities that they're building. What the heck is up with those things? Yeah, uh, it's really interesting, I think. Um, so Server Domes apparently was actually established back in 2016. Uh, I hadn't heard of them until the news this week of uh, Ken Patchett leading the, the team. And he's definitely impressive, right? He was there um, in 1999 at the beginning of some of Microsoft's hyperscale growth. So the, the famous Moz West data center. Um, he's also you know moved through Google and Facebook and, and just has a ton of experience here. Um, and uh, in, including uh, some work with Twitch and, and just a bunch of stuff there. But, but yeah, what, what's, what seems to be really interesting and, and definitely cap, capturing folks' attention uh, now that this news is, has hit is the, the domes themselves. So server domes is uh, a very descriptive name. Uh, and as you said, they, they kind of look like UFOs. So if you haven't seen one of these, uh, I would definitely uh, you know, hit, hit your favorite search engine and, and take a look. Um, they are uh, geodesic domes, um, a la Buckminster Fuller. Of which are which are really interesting, right? So I, when I was growing up, a, a neighbor of ours had one, and and I learned a lot about it. Uh, apparently, they are really structurally sound, and so one of the angles here for server domes is that these are you know resistant to climate change and natural disaster and, and these kind of things, right? So extreme, extreme weather and 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 high wind and rain and w whatever you might throw at it. Uh, they're also made out of aluminum, and they're lights out facilities. So I think the pitch here is is zero maintenance, where you kind of build it, put some servers inside of it. Uh, and then just walk away and, and it just runs. So that, that's pretty interesting. I, I, I assume what they're targeting is kind of this edge market, right? We've seen other companies like Edge Micro or Vapor. There's a couple others out there that are doing these kind of data center in a box, data center at the edge, put it in a parking lot, put it out in the field. Um, and, and this is just a, a new novel approach to that uh, that we hadn't seen before. I do think it's really interesting. Um, and because of the designs, they, they claim that it's uh, really low power and, and really low maintenance. So could be super interesting uh, in that space. So uh, just like you said on the last story, um, I'd watch this one and, and see how that develops. Uh, the new CEO at Intel, Pat Gelsinger, isn't wasting any time trying to change the company's fortunes. He announced on Tuesday that Intel will offer so-called foundry services, producing chips for rival companies in its own fabs. This is something Intel has tried to do before. So why is this time different, Stephen? Yeah, this is a sort of part of the history of the semiconductor business. Uh, for the longest time, uh, companies basically designed and manufactured chips themselves. And then um, in, uh, you know, back in the uh, 90s, uh, this big idea happened that maybe we don't have to have the uh, chip production and the chip development in the same uh, company. And so this gave rise to, of course, the famous uh, and, and now extremely productive uh, services of companies like TSMC and Samsung, which basically take in orders. Um, you know, companies basically ship them a chip design, they schedule it, they lay it out, they develop it and produce the chips themselves, and then they'll ship them back either in uh, raw form or packaged up and ready to go uh, to be used in devices. Now, Intel um, really is not famous for doing this. Intel is famous for creating their own everything. And that's been, uh, you know, sort of part of their, uh, part of their charm. You know, you, you knew that Intel could not only deliver uh, designs, but also deliver functional working chips. Um, and not a, that couldn't necessarily be said of companies that use foundry services, because uh, one of the challenges with foundries is that if you are, a, you know, small fry, you could end up at the back of the queue waiting for your chips to be produced. In fact, there's been some news lately that uh, automobile producers, for example, are um, actually idling assembly lines for cars because they can't get their chips produced. Uh, because, you know, companies like Apple and, uh, you know, NVIDIA are racing ahead of them in order to get their chips produced by these foundry services. So um, basically that's what's going on here. Um, Intel uh, announced a while back that they were actually gonna be using foundry services for some of their chips. They're actually gonna be shipping out some of their designs to be produced by other companies. 
Uh, there's been a lot of speculation about what this means for the company and whether Intel would uh, kind of go the way of AMD and spin off its chip production from its chip design business. That's what you know AMD did about a decade ago. Uh, but it doesn't look like that's what's happening here. Instead, what's happening here is uh, Intel's going to take third-party orders in order to keep their fabs busy. Uh, they've tried this before, but uh, basically, uh, you know, if uh, it's a choice between producing some more Xeons or core uh, processors and producing something for a customer, Intel, uh, I guess the worry was that Intel would uh, prioritize their own needs. So one of the things that's happened here is Intel now has a new business unit uh, with reserved fab capacity that they have to sell to third parties in order to uh, you know, meet their business goals. So essentially Intel's now got their own chip fab business and um, looks like a pretty smart way to do it. I have a suspicion that uh, this could end up not being uh, another bust and could end up being actually a pretty good business for Intel to be in, not least of which, because Intel has fabs here in the USA. And there's been a lot of concern about uh, basically producing companies in South Korea or in Taiwan, or even uh, places like mainland China, where um, you know, for national security reasons and other reasons, companies don't want to produce their chips. So I could see this becoming a really big business for Intel. Um, I'm hearing as well that they are building a, you know, a mega fab uh, in the Southwest and that that fab is gonna have quite a bit of foundry services uh, available there uh, you know, here in the US for American companies. And I think that that could end up being another you know, pretty big success for Intel. So the bottom line is this isn't something new or different or weird for Intel. This has always been on their radar. It's always been something they've kind of tried to do. It just seems like they're doing it right this time and so I'm pretty hopeful to see what happens there with this uh, new uh, Foundry Services offering. Chris, uh, let's turn to discussing a few major stories for a bit more detailed uh, discussion. Uh, back in February, we discussed reports that Amazon's AWS was bringing in enough revenue to become the world's largest storage company. This was a bit controversial because after all, uh, comparing cloud revenues to on-premises storage revenues is really apples and oranges. Uh, but we're going to do it again. So we've got a report here saying that cloud spending is ahead of on-prem spending across all categories in the data center. What should we really make of this story? Yeah, it's, it's super interesting. And I think to starting at looking at the research they came up with, um, you know, basically it does show, as you said, that for the first time in 2020, um, the enterprise workloads in the cloud, you know, surpassed on-premises servers, I think. And it shows that this enterprise spending in, in cloud infrastructure services uh, grew by 35%, which brings it up to about $130 billion in 2020. Uh, and on data center hardware and software actually dropped by 6% to less than 90 billion over the same period. So obviously there's a, a pretty big gap there, not just you know more, but, but quite a bit more. Now, some of this is being attributed to obviously the COVID-19 pandemic and the fact that folks weren't on premises to install or upgrade actual gear. Um, but what's interesting is the data also shows that 60% of new server sales are now going to the data centers of the cloud providers and not to individual organizations. And I think that's a big shift as well to see that more than half the servers are now going into these data centers. And, and that's where I think this really you know, is important. I think obviously the pandemic did have an effect here, but I think that was an accelerant of an already known trend that we've probably talked about quite a bit for the last few years. And, and, and the way I see that is almost as if what we call infrastructure is changing, right? The, the level that um, an organization, a company, and especially now developers look at infrastructure is something different than it was five or 10 years ago. Um, when I first started you know, writing scripts and, and doing networking, infrastructure was physical things uh, with firmware on them maybe or an OS that you then loaded and, and worked on on top of. And now for a lot of folks, I mean, especially, you know, any kids that are, that are coming through computer science class now and, and just getting into development and, and application design and architecture right now, infrastructure is, you know, th this interface at their favorite infrastructure as a service um, company, right? At their, at their public cloud company, um, or maybe uh, a private cloud inside of an organization, but they don't think about the bare metal servers, I think, that are being built on top of. It's more abstracted. And so I think that's what's really interesting here is just that idea of what is infrastructure is, is 
is changing. And, and not only that, but it's changing for bigger and bigger companies and, and companies that we thought would never go to the cloud, right? So there's some folks in oil and gas and in banking that are now moving towards um, a, a public cloud infrastructure versus building their own, which I think is also really, really interesting here. Yeah, that, uh, you know, it really is a, a question, though, of how do we reflect this and what does this say about the market? And I think that I'll go back to my comments about the uh, previous, you know, AWS storage discussion and just point out, you know, one of the things that I said then, and I think still holds true now, is that this question of whether we can count this, whether this is apples and oranges, whether we should dismiss, uh, you know, cloud uh, as a service sales altogether when we're counting revenue. Well, see, that's, I think, the important aspect here. And that is that if we were to dismiss as a service and decide that that is apples and oranges and we're only going to count apples here, well, then we're missing the boat because we're missing the big story. Because literally what's happened now is that the oranges are bigger than the apples. And so if we pretend that, uh, you know, oh, well, cloud as a service revenue doesn't count, only on-premises uh, sales count because that's only real sales. Well, then we're effectively only counting like 40% of the market for uh, IT infrastructure. We have to count it. So yeah, it's apples and oranges. It doesn't, it, it isn't the same. You know, renting a car is not the same as buying a car as uh, one of the uh, analysts said. But that being said, you get a car in exchange for money in both cases. And maybe we should be considering the fact that people are renting a car or taking an Uber instead of buying a car, you know, as it were. Uh, maybe we should be considering the fact that the market has changed and we need to understand that market instead of just dismissing it and saying, well, you know what? Eh, doesn't matter. This isn't real stuff anyway. So yeah, I feel like um, I feel like we need to take a real close look at this. And basically, the analysts, especially the financial side analysts, really need to figure out how they're going to count this revenue uh, because it's here. It's it's half the market or more already. Yeah, I absolutely agree, Stephen. And and I think to your apples and oranges point, right? That's one of the reasons I underlined that idea that now sixty percent of server sales are going into the cloud providers themselves. So even if you're looking at the apples, it seems to have shifted, which means you're one hundred percent right that we need to be looking at this bigger picture. Because uh, if you keep counting the old things, you're you're definitely going to miss disruption, right? Um, speaking of potential disruption, anyway, Intel just announced a special event on April sixth. Uh, they're calling it "How Wonderful Gets Done," and the event will see Intel launch the next generation Xeon capable CPU platform known as Ice Lake. Uh, we've been talking about Ice Lake and rival AMD's Milan server CPUs quite a lot lately. What do you think we'll see in two weeks? Well, I can't uh, really say because of course nobody knows. Uh, Intel is famous for playing their cards close to the vest and not giving people a hint of what they're doing next. But that being said, um, we actually do know. Because frankly, um, there, it's inconceivable that the next generation Xeon is not going to share the same basic architecture as the next generation desktop core processors. Um, of course they are. Of course they're going to do that because they've always done that. So if we take that as a um, item of faith, well, then we can actually say quite a lot about the next generation. Uh, number one, um, when we say Ice Lake, what we're referring to is basically the overall chip architecture here. And, and so we've already seen Ice Lake desktop chips. They already exist. Now we're going to see Ice Lake uh, Xeon chips by, by all accounts or all guesses. I mean, it, 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 I can't imagine that they wouldn't be doing this. So what we're going to see probably is similar to AMD's Milan launch. We're going to see a new core. And that new core, like Milan, is uh, about 18% faster than the old one on a clock-for-clock -clock basis. So right there, Intel is going to be announcing sort of a bit of a catch-up on the AMD side, you know, compared to the rival AMD Epic processors on a sort of core-for-core -core, uh, basis. Another thing that we can probably safely say is that these chips are going to incorporate some new features. Um, the desktop chips have 
uh, new AVX 512 instructions uh, that are pretty exciting and interesting if you're doing some kind of advanced calculations. Um, they also have a, a deep learning capability, a deep learning boost uh, built into those desktop chips. And uh, I can't imagine we wouldn't see that on the Xeon side. So that would give Intel basically a machine learning coprocessor in the, in the server CPU. I bet we're gonna see that. The other thing though, and this is the big news, is that um, everyone is expecting that Intel is gonna add PCI Express 4.0 to these uh, chips and probably that they're going to expand the number of channels and expand the number of memory channels as well. Uh, the reason we're suspecting this is number one, Intel has already launched PCIe 4 on the desktop side <laughs> with uh, you know, their uh, Tiger Lake. Uh, another reason is that um, frankly, Intel has been behind uh, in this area and AMD has been eating their lunch. So AMD has been shipping PCIe 4 for quite a while. Uh, AMD has basically become the server reference platform for PCIe 4, and uh, Intel needs to be there. Frankly, if they don't announce a server CPU with PCIe 4, uh, close it down and go home. Uh, I mean, and, and, I, and I know that that sounds horrible, but frankly, um, you know, they are already behind. That would put them hopelessly behind. So I bet that they're going to do that. I bet we're going to see PCIe 4 here. Furthermore, uh, you know, one of the big criticisms of Intel has been that there hasn't been as much uh, exposed I.O. out of those chips. I really expect that we'll see more I.O. channels just because, I mean, this is criticism that we gave them at the Xeon Scalable launch, you know, what, three years ago, two years ago, one year ago. Uh, and now here we are again. And I think that, um, you know, if, if I'm smart enough to see that, I think Intel's smart enough to see that and they're probably going to address it. I actually just did a, uh, a Gestalt IT checksum uh, editorial recording about the AMD Milan launch. And in that checksum, I said something that's probably a little bit controversial, which is basically that I'm underwhelmed by AMD's launch. A lot of the tech press has been saying, hallelujah, you know, Milan is awesome. Well, yeah, it's good, but there's no news there. It's just a bit of a speed bump. Whereas Intel's Ice Lake is probably gonna be a huge upgrade for the Intel server platform. So I actually think that Intel has a real good chance to deliver a competitive product here. Another thing I pointed out in that editorial is that AMD is asking top dollar for their Milan, you know, third generation Epic uh, server CPU cores, literally twice as much as uh, some of the Intel chips in the same, uh, you know, the same range. And not only that, but they're actually, uh, AMD kind of skimped on the low end parts, the kind of volume parts that you see in um, you know, one U servers and two U servers all over the place. In fact, a lot of those are still second generation uh, Epic processors that they're still offering. I think that Intel is gonna see this as an opportunity. They're gonna come in here, maybe they won't have a 64 core, you know, quad core server CPU that's gonna compete with Epic on the ultra high end. But I think that Intel is going to come in here with a competitive product that's going to attack the middle and the low end of the market. It's going to be priced competitively. It's going to have competitive features, competitive performance. And frankly, I think that this is a huge opportunity for Intel. The other thing I'll point out too is that everyone expects that both Intel and AMD are already working on their next generation and that the next generation is going to be a huge bump with a totally new design um, you know, bringing a lot more features, a lot more cores, a lot more of everything to the table. And not only that, but Intel is finally getting around to the seven nanometer space. Uh, they've kind of been edging up to it with their fabs. And I think that by the time the next generation processors are being announced and delivered, Intel is going to be quite competitive on the fab aspect as well. So yeah, I think that this generation is going to be pretty exciting. I think the April 6th launch is going to be pretty exciting. Uh, on a chip for chip basis. Also, I expect that Intel is going to go do Intel, which is to talk more about sort of the market and the products and the positioning, whereas M AMD is always about, you know, hey, chip this, chip that. And I think that that's going to serve Intel pretty well, you know, with uh, all the other parts of the computer that they make. And I think that the next generation is really going to shape up as a, uh, you know, a golden opportunity for Intel. I can't wait to see what the launch includes. Yeah, it sounds like it's really going to be an exciting event, uh, and you've covered it really well here. Uh, I, I wonder if there's something you know that I can ask you about. You know, when we talk about 18% performance gains, I mean, obviously that's significant, right? Um, but 
one thing that always rattles around the back of my head is, you know, how dead is Moore's law? And when we're talking about, you know, the, the two major manufacturers have both kind of come out with less than 20%, you know, speed increases. Obviously, we've been throwing more cores at things for a long time. Um, is Moore's law totally dead at this point? I mean, where are we at there? Well, you know, Moore's law isn't dead. It's just the, the architectures of x86 that are causing a big roadblock for it. Effectively, um, you know, x86 is just a real hard platform, all the 64-bit, uh, which is, by the way, <laughs> created by AMD. So AMD 64 is a pretty hard architecture to optimize beyond what we've currently got. And so honestly, I have to say that, you know, my hat is off to these chip designers for delivering even a 15% or an 18% or 20% performance boost. And effectively, all they're able to do in order to deliver that nowadays is some tweaks here and there and maybe more level one and level two caches. Um, because basically, that's all you can do, especially given the fact that we've got all these, you know, specter and meltdown and stuff like that, that we've got to worry about. And that stuff really impacts the ability to scale performance on a per core basis as well. So the answer is effectively more cores. And, uh, you know, like I said, AMD is delivering 64 cores on a chip now. Um, wow. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's pretty cool. Uh, Intel is uh, also offering, uh, like I said, all these coprocessor cores now. So, you know, you've got, uh, you know, the DL boost cores, uh, you know, we're seeing that on the ARM side as well. We've got, um, you know, the GPU cores that are coming in, uh, you know, AMD obviously has some pretty good uh, GPU technology and Intel's next generation GPU stuff is pretty exciting too. So I think that basically the answer is we've got to figure out how to use more cores, more parallel cores, more specialized cores in order to keep Moore's law alive. And one more thing I'll point out, one of the reasons that Apple was able to deliver such a world beating processor in their M1 is simply because the ARM architecture is just more amenable to that. So um, when, when it talks to, uh, you know, when it comes to chip design, they, they talk about basically two ways to improve performance. And, and that's by making your, your uh, uh, tuning wider or deeper. And so you make um, either more internal paths or you make you know, deeper internal paths. Apple was able to do both of that with their M1 because ARM is just more amenable to doing that and Apple controls the whole platform. And that's one reason that M1 is so ridiculously better on an instructions per core basis, uh, at least with the same you know, transistors. Uh, you know, like I said, the only reason that AMD and Intel are even able to be competitive here is because they're able to throw lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of cash and, uh, you know, that sort of thing at it. Cash in terms of, uh, you know, caching data, but cash in terms of uh, development cash too. So anyway, yeah, I, I think that this uh, really does talk more about the limits of uh, the x86 uh, 64-bit architecture than it does uh, Moore's Law specifically. But I think that we do also need to consider the fact that we need to be able to use all, you know, more and more and more cores across all of our software in order to make better use of the silicon that we have. So uh, one final note here, Chris, um, you know, those of you who are uh, tuning in for the rundown frequently know that we love to talk about Microsoft. We love to talk about Slack and Teams and all this kind of stuff. Well, we heard this week that Microsoft is going after uh, another angle here and may actually be buying Discord. Um, many people know Discord more as sort of a casual gaming, you know, something their kids use, but it's also uh, used in the enterprise and used in, uh, you know, open source and a lot of other areas. And uh, it's seen as a competitor for Slack, but also for um, the new golden baby known as Clubhouse, uh, where we usually record the, uh, the rundown. Um, what does it mean Microsoft, if Microsoft buys Discord? What would they buy and uh, what would the thing be? Yeah, it's an interesting question. And I think it's still a little bit open and definitely a big part of it is on the consumer side, right? So this was announced um, by Bloomberg uh, late on Monday. Uh, and, you know, potentially it's a, a $10 billion acquisition of Discord by Microsoft. Uh, what's interesting there is Discord just raised 140 million last December. By um, that that round was led by Green Lakes Capital was an E round, and that took their value their valuation up to seven billion. So this is a, a little bit of a premium in a pretty quick amount of time. Uh, but what's interesting here is Discord already has over 140 million active monthly users, 
Uh, and if you look at that again, in, in kind of the, the social media space, Compared to Twitter, Twitter's at about 192 monthly users. So, I mean, really on their heels there. And then what's also interesting is the way Discord is organized, if you haven't used it, is by servers. So there's all these individual servers. And um, in addition to those 140 million active monthly users, Discord has 6.7 million active servers. So a lot of these uh, are, are around gaming, right? So they've got these pub popular and verified servers um, PUBG Mobile, Clash Royale, Minecraft, um, Zooms Royale, Rainbox, uh, Rainbox Six Siege, Spellbreak, and, and Valorant. Um, so a lot of this is on the consumer side, but I think that model is really, really interesting. And as you said, you know, potentially mirrors something what they're doing in teams, right? Where these servers could become teams or become companies and be able to interlink and, and have these conversations. So, so while a lot of folks are looking at the fact that, you know, Discord's premium service called Nitro, could potentially boost the Xbox subscriptions, right? As adding another feature that would come with Xbox Live and, and, and have, have another reason for them to pay for that. Um, there, there could be an enterprise play here as well. Um, obviously they bought LinkedIn. Um, they also bought Minecraft. So these are, you know, this would be the biggest kind of social media purchase that Microsoft had made. Although they were toying around with buying TikTok, right? For, for almost $30 billion. And as you said, Stephen, uh, they also, uh, Discord brought voice chat in before Clubhouse did. So this is, I think it's a super interesting play. Oh, a lot of things kind of coming together here. And um, one aspect though, that's also interesting is the antitrust part of this, right? So Microsoft has definitely been on a spending spree, uh, which, which makes sense. They've got the third biggest cash reserve of, of the tech giants, right? So, um, and they have got a lot of money to spend. But spending that money can definitely open them up, right? They, so far, they haven't been gone after by the SEC in the way that some of the other tech giants have. But uh, that's another aspect here where this may open them up to um, some of that interest. Yeah, I guess the my question is going to be which part of Microsoft would buy Discord. So let's say Microsoft does this. Let's say they buy Discord. Uh, my question is, is it the Xbox gaming division? In, in which case we could see Discord kind of becoming a competitor for Twitch, uh, which is over at Amazon. It could become a competitor for Reddit, for Twitter. Uh, you know, it could become a new sort of a gamer service. Uh, we could also see, as I said, if, if Microsoft buys it in the enterprise space, we could see it as a uh, add-on to Teams. You know, maybe this is a way to help Teams scale. Maybe they you know, kind of direct Discord in that direction. I could even see it as a competitor for Zoom. Uh, I know that Microsoft ought to have been able to compete with Zoom and wasn't, but, you know, Discord has got a, sort of a next generation um, a watering hole kind of feel to it. And I think that, uh, you know, maybe that could be an angle here. Uh, and as I said, of course, you know, you, th you think about Twitter, you think about Facebook, you think about uh, Clubhouse, Microsoft has LinkedIn. What if LinkedIn plus Discord equals Twitter, Facebook, Clubhouse, something? You know, it, it's really hard to say where they would take this technology. And frankly, maybe they would just leave it as Discord. You know, I mean, that's kind of what they did with Minecraft. I mean, it is actually similar architecturally and in, in terms of user base to Minecraft. Maybe they'd just buy it and just be good stewards of it, like, you know, GitHub and stuff. So, We'll see what happens with this. Um, you know, overall, uh, it used to be that being bought by Microsoft was a death sentence for your product or your company. Uh, nowadays, frankly, being bought by Microsoft is kind of exciting, isn't it? So I guess we'll see what happens, uh, what happens here, but I'm not totally down on this idea. Well, you know, Stephen, there's another aspect of this that I think is potentially interesting, which is the evolution of social media. So even if this isn't, even if it goes to the Xbox side or, or becomes, you know, just a social media play for Microsoft in the consumer space, I think it's still interesting to kind of the overall global conversation around social media because of this aspect of Discord, as we talked about with these servers, right? So similar to Clubhouse, where you've got these like individual groups that are talking together versus a single feed of just everything being public. And, and I think that seems to be a trend in some social media where folks are kind of going off into these Slack rooms, going off into Teams, whatever they might be, and having these more private conversations uh, versus just doing everything publicly on, say, a Twitter or a Facebook. And so that's another aspect to watch. Again, maybe not as enterprisey, um, but, but definitely interesting to me. 
Yeah, absolutely, Chris. And I really feel like, you know, Microsoft has, uh, they've got uh, good instincts here. So this is going to be really interesting. Well, thanks so much for this conversation, Chris. It's great to have you joining us uh, for this episode of the Gestalt IT Rundown. Um, you know, we have you joining us for the Utilizing AI podcast as well, and that's always a lot of fun. Uh, but where else can we connect with you and uh, learn more about your thinking on this topic and uh, enterprise IT in general? Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Um, the best place to find out kind of all the things I'm doing is on my website, chrisgrundeman.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at Chris Grundeman. And uh, I do a lot of writing uh, around the web, including the Gestalt IT blog. So take a look. Well, thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, and you can find me uh, writing as well at gestaltit.com, where I just published an editorial, as I mentioned, about AMD's Milan and how it's given Intel an opportunity with Ice Lake. Uh, you'll also see uh, Tech Field Day joining Intel for this Ice Lake discussion uh, on April 6th and 7th. And I can't wait to be bringing you a live stream of that at techfieldday.com. You can also listen to my podcast, Utilizing AI, every Tuesday. And of course, uh, you'll find me right here on The Rundown. Remember that The Rundown is published uh, as a podcast as well as on YouTube every Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time at youtube.com slash gestaltitvideo. We also post the videos on our Facebook page, uh, facebook.com slash gestaltit, and we'd love to see you there. We'll be back next Wednesday to talk about more IT news of the week that was. But until then, for myself, Stephen Foskett, and for all of us here at the Gestalt IT family, here's wishing you and yours a truly memorable day.